Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. Let's get back into studying Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder. I think this should be the last episode in this series. I'll try to cover all the remaining chapters, so chapter 9, left-wing communism in Great Britain, chapter 10, several conclusions, and uh, there's also the appendix. I'm not really gonna say anything about the appendix, but you should read it regardless. Let's just get right into it. There's some repetition of stuff that's already been said, but there's also some new ideas that are added. Lenin comments on this text by a young British communist who expresses some ultra-left views, and Lenin says about that, quote, In my opinion, this letter to the editor expresses excellently the temper and point of view of the young communists or the rank-and-file workers who are only just beginning to accept communism. This temper is highly gratifying and valuable. We must learn to appreciate and support it, for, in its absence, it would be hopeless to expect the victory of the proletarian revolution in Great Britain, or in any other country for that matter. People who can give expression to this temper of the masses and are able to evoke such a temper, which is very often dormant, unconscious and latent, among the masses, should be appreciated and given every assistance. Unquote. I think what we should take away from this um, excerpt is that these days we might call them like noob communists or whatever. There's these communists who, uh, you know, they're new, they're just getting into communism. And they might make statements that are historically inaccurate, theoretically incorrect or inaccurate or whatever. But that's not always such a bad thing. Like, of course, we should politely tell them, uh, okay, comrade, th- what you're saying is a little bit incorrect. And, you know, correct them and give them more information and make their um, understanding more precise. But oftentimes when you see people making, you know, let's say they make these ultra-radical statements... In a way, that's good because it demonstrates that they're enthusiastic, they have the right mindset, they may not have sufficient knowledge on the topic, but at least they have the right attitude, the right mindset, so that's a starting point, that's very good. I think it would be much worse if there's a person who has a lot of knowledge, but then their attitude is just all wrong. Lenin continues, quote, At the same time, we must tell them openly and frankly that a state of mind is by itself insufficient for leadership of the masses in a great revolutionary struggle, and that the cause of the revolution may be harmed by certain errors that people who are most devoted to the cause of the revolution are about to commit or are committing. Comrade Gallagher's letters undoubtedly reveals the rudiments of all the mistakes that are being made by the German so-called left communists and were made by the Russian so-called left Bolsheviks in 1908 and 1918. The writer of the letter is full of a noble and working-class hatred for the bourgeois, so-called class politicians. In a representative of the oppressed and exploited masses, this hatred is truly, so to say, the beginning of all wisdom, the basis of any socialist and communist movement and of its success. The writer, however, has apparently lost sight of the fact that politics is a science and an art that does not fall from the skies or come gratis, and that, if it wants to overcome the bourgeoisie, the proletariat must train its own proletarian class politicians of a kind in no way inferior to bourgeois politicians, unquote. So basically, a state of mind or a revolutionary attitude is obviously not enough, you also need knowledge, although as Lenin says, this attitude, this revolutionary mindset is the beginning, it's the beginning of all wisdom, it all starts from there, like we've all been there, I think, and hopefully we still have that same attitude, just uh, refined and uh, improved with more knowledge and more experience. But this letter of this uh, British left communist, it makes all the usual uh, ultra-leftist mistakes. So it uh, it attacks bosses and um, professional politicians and whatnot. And those are sentiments that are widespread among the masses. They're a bit demagogic sentiments. It's not about bosses and it's not about politicians per se, but it's just that those are capitalist bosses and capitalist politicians. They're an expression of the will of the capitalist class. They're not politicians in the abstract. Politicians are not a class, but those sentiments are very healthy. If the masses are mad at politicians, if they're mad at uh, bosses at their workplace and whatnot, that demonstrates a rudimentary class instinct. It shows that at least they oppose what's going on. At least they're critical of the prevailing system. Although, as Lenin says, the proletariat actually needs to train its own politicians. And then uh, Lenin remarks on the fact that this uh, British writer says that we need Soviets uh, and not parliaments, that parliaments cannot be an instrument of revolution, only the Soviets can be an instrument of revolution. Lenin agrees, Lenin says that this is completely correct, anybody who denies this is a reactionary. 
And that's a very important thing to remember, that the parliament cannot be an instrument of revolution, as the Eurocommunists say, but you actually need to have a revolution outside the parliament. In certain specific conditions, such as in um, the Baltic countries in 1940 and in uh, Eastern European countries in 1946 to 48, there was a transition to a proletarian state using the parliament. However, the actual revolution still happened outside the parliament, and it wasn't only a parliamentary thing. Uh, I can't really get into the details of that here, I'm just saying. If you want to see more details, then you can watch, uh, for example, my ongoing series on the Hungarian People's Republic. That's where I talk about that in great detail. But Lenin says that although the parliament alone cannot be used for a revolution, and although the parliament is not sufficient for revolution, we should still participate in parliament because we can use the parliament to disintegrate parliamentarism from within. So having some guys in the parliament doesn't actually hinder the uh, revolution that happens outside the parliament, extra-parliamentarily. Then Lenin remarks on a speech given by Lloyd George, where Lloyd George demands that the liberals and the conservatives have to unite against the Labour Party and against Bolshevism. It's worth reading what Lenin says about this. This is an interesting phenomena that uh, took place in a lot of countries back in the day, even in this country. There used to be so many different right-wing parties, while there was only one working-class party, but eventually the capitalist forces realized that they have to all uh, join together in one or two big right-wing parties in order to uh, combat the working class. Lenin also refers to articles by a British left communist by the name of Sylvia Pankhurst. He says, quote, The left communists believe that the transfer of power to the Labour Party is inevitable and admit that it now has the backing of most workers. For this they draw the strange conclusion which comrade Sylvia Pankhurst formulates as follows. Quote, the Communist Party must not compromise, the Communist Party must keep its doctrine pure, and its independence of reformism inviolate. Its mission is to lead the way without stopping or turning by the direct road to the Communist Revolution. Unquote. On the contrary, the fact that most British workers still follow the lead of the British Kerenskys or Scheidemanns and have not yet had experience of a government composed of these people, an experience which was necessary in Russia and Germany so as to secure the mass transition of the workers to communism, undoubtedly indicates that the British communists should participate in parliamentary action, that they should, from within parliament, help the masses of the workers see the results of a Henderson and Snowden government in practice, and that they should help the Hendersons and Snowdens defeat the united forces of Lloyd George and Churchill. To act otherwise would mean hampering the cause of the revolution, since revolution is impossible without a change in the views of the majority of the working class, a change brought about by the political experience of the masses, never by propaganda alone. There's quite a lot to unpack there. But basically, the left communists, they say that it's inevitable that the Labour Party is going to win the elections and form a government. Therefore, the communists should not support the Labour Party in any way. Instead, the communists should oppose the Labour Party in every way. Otherwise, they will become entangled into compromises. They will become involved in reformism, etc., etc. And also, the left communists say that they have to uh, lead the way to communism directly without stopping or turning. Well, we've already talked about that a lot in the past regarding uh, parliaments and regarding uh, compromises and zigzags and whatever. But the main point here is that Lenin says that uh, the Labour Party is sort of analogous to the Russian Mensheviks or right SRs or the Trudoviks, which was uh, Kerensky's party, that they're sort of analogous to Kerensky, the leader of the Russian provisional government. So just like the Bolsheviks participated in the parliament and supported the February Revolution, similarly the British communists should support a similar development taking place in Britain and also participate in parliaments. And just like the Bolsheviks uh, helped facilitate the collapse of the um, old bourgeois parties in Russia, like the cadets and the octobrists and whatever, even worse parties, similarly, in Britain they should help facilitate the defeat of the liberals and conservatives. And then, what would happen is the Labour Party would form a government, just like Kerensky formed a government, and that would be a good thing, even though it would only be a stage in a process, it wouldn't be a good thing in of itself, it wouldn't be the end goal. Instead, what would happen next is that 
Once the Labour Party forms a government, and it pretends to be a socialist government, it pretends to be a working class government, it would inevitably betray all its promises and it would demonstrate to the workers that actually this is not a working class government and instead anybody who wants a genuine working class government has to support the communists. That is what happened in Russia. The workers and peasants, they supported Kerensky because they thought Kerensky would uh, bring them what they want. The Bolsheviks formulated those slogans as peace, bread and land. But Kerensky didn't bring that. Instead, Kerensky continued the rule of capitalists and landlords and the imperialist war. There is no question that the Labour Party would do the same. They would also support imperialist colonialism. They would support capitalism. And because they would lose support from the masses, just like Kerensky did, they would have to seek alliances more and more with the capitalists. Thus, demonstrating to the workers what the reality of the situation is, which is that... Mensheviks, right-wing social democrats, they are not genuine working class uh, politicians, but they are traitors to the working class and we shouldn't support them. The main point, or at least one of the main points, is what he says at the very end, which is um, that a revolution is impossible without a change in the views of the majority of the working class. A change brought about by the political experience of the masses, never by propaganda alone. He's going to get into this more later, but basically... Propaganda is important, it's even crucial, but propaganda is never enough to convince the majority of the working class. You can convince a revolutionary core of the working class by um, propaganda and theory uh, and ideology, but when it comes to convincing the majority of the working class, let alone even the broader masses, propaganda is not going to be enough. Instead, it has to be because of the actual political experience of the masses. So the masses... They will only become communists or they will only start supporting communism or sympathizing with communism if they experience the betrayal of the social democrats. That's what Lenin is saying. Now, applying this in our modern day practice, that is obviously a difficult thing. This is something that should be very thought-provoking for all of us, I think. We shouldn't apply this too mechanically now because... uh, First of all, Lenin says that we need to first convince the vanguard of the working class. Well, we haven't even done that, so we have to do that first. We have to build stronger parties. Only after that we can start thinking about this. Although those stages obviously are not fully separate, you should be convincing the vanguard and building the party, while at the same time also trying to gain support from the masses. But I think it's obvious that uh, in these conditions, let's say in... um, Finland or the US or whatever, communists shouldn't support, let's say, the social democrats in Finland or the uh, democratic party in the US. That simply wouldn't achieve anything. But we'll get more into those details as we go along, so it should become a little bit more clear. At this point in time, when Lenin was writing, there was no single communist party in the UK. The communist party was founded in 1920, right after this. So, This is what Lenin says the British communists should do. He says, quote, I will put it more concretely. In my opinion, the British communists should unite their four parties and groups, all very weak and some of them very, very weak, into a single communist party on the basis of the principles of the Third International and of obligatory participation in Parliament. The communist party should propose the following, quote-unquote, compromise, election, agreement to the Hendersons and Snowdens. Let us jointly fight against the alliance between Lloyd George and the Conservatives, Let us share parliamentary seats in proportion to the number of workers' votes polled for the Labour Party and for the Communist Party, not in elections, but in a special ballot. And let us retain complete freedom of agitation, propaganda, and political activity. Of course, without this latter condition, we cannot agree to a bloc, for that would be treachery. The British Communists must demand and get complete freedom to expose the Hendersons and the Snowdens in the same way as, for 15 years, 1903-17, to The Russian Bolsheviks demanded and got it in respect of the Russian Hendersons and Snowdens, that is, the Mensheviks, unquote. So, the communists, they should basically make what we call a technical, at least in in Finnish we call it a technical election alliance, which means that there's no joint program, but we just unite um, purely technically, so we combine the the amount of votes that uh, both uh, parties get in the election, and then we divvy up, share the number of seats based on uh, who got the most votes. Although Lenin says that they should uh, distribute them based on a special ballot. And the communists 
should have full freedom to criticize the Labour Party at all times. So what this would achieve is that they would help the Labour Party come to power, they would also help themselves get parliamentary seats, and then once the Labour Party does come to power, and even before it comes to power, the communists can explain to the workers that the Labour Party is actually not a genuine proletarian party, and then, you know, once the Labour Party forms a government and starts implementing capitalist policies, then the communists can fully expose them and tell the workers, hey look, this is what we told you, the Labour Party are a bunch of uh, pawns of the capitalists, so now, if you want an actual workers' government, you should uh, become uh, radicalized and support communism instead. Is this fully applicable in our modern day? In our current conditions, in a lot of countries, no. First of all, like, the communist parties are all so small that, you know, imagine if, like, some American communist party would uh, propose an election agreement with the Democrats. The Democrats probably wouldn't even answer the email. They don't care. Like, the Democrats are such a huge party, and the communist parties are all so small that, um, you know, they wouldn't even reply. Maybe the Democrats are not a good example because they're not even remotely a workers' party, but, I mean, the same goes for the Labour Party. Like, imagine if some British communist organization emailed the Labour Party and said, like, let's make an election block. They would never agree to it. They wouldn't even answer the email, especially with these conditions. So it just wouldn't make any sense. Instead, what has happened is that some communist parties, for example, um, CPUSA, they have unconditionally support the Democrats, which means they don't get anything in return, but they just support the Democrats. And they even uh, don't criticize the Democrats. So that's just completely wrong. That's, that's a complete travesty. Let's keep going. So then Lenin says, quote, If the Hendersons and the Snowdens accept a block on these terms, we shall be the gainers, because the number of parliamentary seats is of no importance to us. We are not out for seats. We shall be the gainers, because we shall carry our agitation among the masses at a time when Lloyd George himself has incensed them, and shall not only be helping the Labour Party to establish its government sooner, but shall also be helping the masses sooner to understand the communist propaganda that we shall carry on against the Hendersons, without any reticence or omission." Unquote. By the way, this is also where um, Lenin makes the famous statement, he says that uh, we should support the Labour Party in the same way that a rope supports a hanging man. Further, he says, quote, If the Hendersons and the Snowdens reject the block with us on these terms, we shall gain still more, for we shall at once have shown the masses that the Hendersons prefer their close relations with the capitalists to the unity of all the workers, unquote. This is something that historically took place in many countries and which was used exactly in the way uh, described by Lenin. Communist trade unions, communist peace organizations, whatnot. They proposed all kinds of uh, united fronts with uh, social democrat peace organizations and social democrat trade union federations. And uh, the communists also, in some instances, they supported a uh, united front with the social democrats. For instance, against fascism and war, sometimes uh, to create a uh, people's democratic government without capitalists. And in the vast majority of instances, the social democrats refused. And every time they did that, the communists said to the masses, look, these guys, they always talk about how they want unity and, you know, the communists are annoying them and whatnot. But every time the communists genuinely offer a united front or collaboration for some kind of good cause, they always reject it and instead they ally with the capitalists. So the social democrats are actually the splitters. They don't want unity. The communists have always been wanting the unity of the entire working class because that actually would support the cause of socialism. Then lastly, in this chapter, Lenin says um, that there's been a conversation about the communists actually joining the Labour Party or being members both of the Labour Party and of the Communist Party. Uh, but Lenin says that he doesn't uh, really know enough about that, so he's not going to comment on that. I'm also not very knowledgeable about the history of British communism, but I think that happened but the Labour Party started purging itself of communists, as far as I know. I think that whole analogy with uh, Kerensky coming to power, Bolshevik supporting Kerensky coming into power, at the same time criticizing him and facilitating his downfall, using Kerensky as a stage in the revolution, I think that's something that we should really think about. 
Although, like I said, we shouldn't apply that mechanically to our modern day conditions because the conditions really are so different. Not because just time has passed and because, you know, those kinds of things, but because there were previous steps that had to happen and in our day those haven't happened. So we haven't won over the vanguard of the working class right now. We don't have strong parties, etc., etc. Now let's move on to the final chapter called Several Conclusions. First, Lenin gives a little bit of context and then briefly formulates what the communists have to do. He says, quote, In the brief space of a year, the Third International has already scored a decisive victory. It has defeated the yellow social chauvinist Second International, which only a few months ago was incomparably stronger than the Third International, seemed stable and powerful. It is now essential that communists of every country should quite consciously take into account both the fundamental objectives of the struggle against opportunism and left doctrinarism. Dissatisfaction with the Second International is felt everywhere and is spreading and growing, both because of its opportunism and because of its inability or incapacity to create a really centralized and really leading center capable of directing the international tactics of the revolutionary proletariat in its struggle for a world Soviet republic. Unquote. So the Second International has collapsed both because of its opportunism and also because it has uh, failed in creating what the workers actually want and what the workers actually need. Lenin continues, quote, It should be clearly realized that such a leading center can never be built on a stereotyped, mechanically equated and identical tactical rules of struggle. The unity of the international tactics of the communist working class movement in all countries demands an application of the fundamental principles of communism, Soviet power and the dictatorship of the proletariat, which will correctly modify these principles in certain particulars, correctly adapt and apply them to national and national state distinctions, to seek out, investigate, predict and grasp that which is nationally specific and nationally distinctive in the concrete manner in which each country should tackle a single international task, the victory over opportunism and left doctrinarism within the working class movement, the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, the establishment of a Soviet republic and a proletarian dictatorship. Such is the basic task in the historical period that all the advanced countries, and not they alone, are going through. Unquote. Here, it is easy to fall into either of two mistaken positions, either completely mechanically applying the experience of a different country and not realizing the local peculiarities and the local differences at all, or the opposite, which I think is even more common, especially these days, is to exaggerate the local peculiarities and the local differences and say that actually, no, the universal experience of the communist movement doesn't apply here because our country is somehow different. What the communists have to do in those conditions, according to Lenin, is simply defeat right-wing opportunism, defeat left-wing doctrinarism, overthrow the capitalists, establish a Soviet republic and a dictatorship of the proletariat. Is that still accurate and timely in our day? I think it is. There were some instances where a proletarian dictatorship was established, so to say, without the Soviet form, that is, uh, without exactly Soviet institutions, such as in the Paris Commune and in the People's Democracies. But the Paris Commune uh, failed, but it also had a lot of similarities to a Soviet form. In fact, it was kind of the prototype of it. And the People's Democracies, although they did not exactly have a Soviet form, they started to um, move in that direction pretty quickly. The People's Democracies, for instance, uh, officially established Soviets in Hungary, the communists came to power in 1948, and Soviets were established as local organs of working class power in 1950. So there can be a little bit of variation, but I think having Soviets is key. Also, we understand that the people's democracies were only created in exceptional circumstances, so they are not the rule, they're uh, an exception. Then Lenin says, quote, the chief thing has already been achieved, the vanguard of the working class has been won over, has ranged itself on the side of Soviet government and against parliamentarism, on the side of the dictatorship of the proletariat and against bourgeois democracy. All efforts and all attention should now be concentrated on the next step, which may seem, and from a certain viewpoint actually is, less fundamental, but on the other hand is actually closer to a practical accomplishment of the task. That step is the search after forms of the transition or the approach to the proletarian revolution. The proletarian vanguard has been won over ideologically, that is the main thing. Without this, not even the first step towards victory can be made. 
but that is still quite a long way from victory. Victory cannot be won with a vanguard alone. To throw only the vanguard into the decisive battle before the entire class, the broad masses, have taken up a position either of direct support for the vanguard, or at least of sympathetic neutrality toward it, and of precluded support for the enemy, would be not merely foolish but criminal. Propaganda and agitation alone are not enough for an entire class, the broad masses of the working people, those oppressed by capital, to take up such a stand. For that, the masses must have their own political experience. Such is the fundamental law of all great revolutions." Unquote. I think that should be fairly clear. First, the communists must win over the active, organized workers and create a strong party. That's the first thing, but after that, they still have a long way to go. They have to find the forms to transition to the actual revolution. And the revolution cannot be made by the vanguard alone, it has to be made by the entire class and the broad masses. Making a premature revolution, throwing only the vanguard into the revolution, would be adventurous and would result in catastrophe, as we have seen in some instances. The July days in the Russian Revolution, uh, the so-called pork mutiny in Finland, the Spartacist uprising in Germany, etc. etc. Okay, let's talk about two remaining points. Lenin goes more into detail about winning over the vanguard of the proletariat versus winning over the rest of the proletariat. He says, quote, While the first historical objective, that of winning over the class-conscious vanguard of the proletariat, could not have been reached without a complete ideological and political victory over opportunism, the second and immediate objective, which consists in being able to lead the masses to a new position, ensuring the victory of the vanguard in the revolution, cannot be reached without the liquidation of left doctrinarism and without a full elimination of its errors. As long as it was, and inasmuch as it still is, a question of winning the proletariat's vanguard over to the side of communism, priority went and still goes to propaganda work. Even propaganda circles, with all their parochial limitations, are useful under these conditions and produce good results. But when it is a question of practical action by the masses, then propagandist methods alone, the mere repetition of the truths of quote-unquote pure communism, are of no avail." Unquote. So, in order to win over the best, the most active, organized workers, it was necessary to defeat right-wing opportunism, to defeat right-wing social democracy, and in that, propaganda, explanation, and theory played a decisive role, because those were people who were receptive to propaganda and explanation and theory. They were relatively knowledgeable people who were already organized. However, when it comes to the broader masses, the workers who are not organized or who are at least not very active, who are not as interested, not as political, those kinds of methods don't work on them. And left doctrinarism, this kind of ultra-radicalism which demands uh, absolute uh, quote-unquote ideological purity and in general is very out of touch with the masses, left doctrinarism is a massive hindrance to this next step. So in this next step, when you have to reach the broader masses, liquidating left doctrinarism is necessary. And for this next step, propaganda is not enough. Instead, you have to start organizing the masses and start building up their political experience. In a revolutionary situation, people who are not usually political, they become politicized and they become interested in politics. And in those situations, they can, through their own personal experience, start to understand the truth of communism not because of uh, any kind of elaborate theoretical explanations. Or at least they will understand the correctness of the communist demands and they will sympathize with the demands and goals of the communists. And lastly, Lenin talks about legal versus illegal methods. Uh, these are sometimes called um, open versus conspiratorial methods, what have you. Illegal in this doesn't necessarily mean that it's criminal or that it's criminalized. Instead, it just means underground. Conspiratorial also kind of has a strange connotation to it. It doesn't mean that it's a conspiracy, it's just, it's secret, it's underground. Of course, some underground activity is illegal, because in some countries, communist parties are illegal. Lenin says, quote, Unless we learn to apply all the methods of struggle, we may suffer grave and sometimes even decisive defeat. If changes beyond our control in the position of the other classes bring to the forefront a form of activity in which we are especially weak. Unquote. There are countless examples of this. Practically every time the situation changes, weaknesses in the communist parties are exposed. The Finnish Social Democrat Party, before it even became a communist party, when it was still an old-school uh, Marxist party, 
they were not used to underground methods. So when the situation called for that, they were in a lot of trouble. The same happened in Germany, obviously. The German Social Democrat Party was not at all used to underground methods. Instead, the whole party betrayed the revolution and the Spartacists had to create a new party from scratch. So this is very common, but also the opposite has also happened countless times. So when underground communist parties became legal after the Second World War, it was often very difficult for them to adapt to that new situation and start fully taking advantage of legal opportunities and to use them as effectively as their competitors. Lenin continues, quote, Inexperienced revolutionaries often think that legal methods of struggle are opportunist because in this field the bourgeoisie has most frequently deceived and duped the workers, particularly in so-called peaceful and non-revolutionary times, while illegal methods of struggle are revolutionary. That, however, is wrong. The truth is that those parties and leaders are opportunist and traitors to the working class that are unable or unwilling to use illegal methods of struggle in conditions such as those which prevailed, for example, during the Imperialist War of 1914-1918, to 1918, unquote. So using legal and public methods is not opportunist in itself. The opportunists are opportunists because they only use legal methods even when the situation calls for underground methods. Lenin continues, quote, But revolutionaries who are incapable of combining illegal forms of struggle with every form of legal struggle are poor revolutionaries indeed. It is not difficult to be a revolutionary when revolution has already broken out and is in spate, when all people are joining the revolution just because they are carried away, because it is the vogue, and sometimes even from careerist motives. It is far more difficult and far more precious to be able to champion the interests of the revolution by propaganda, agitation, and organization in non-revolutionary bodies, and quite often in downright reactionary bodies, in a non-revolutionary situation among the masses who are incapable of immediately appreciating the need for revolutionary methods of action. To be able to seek, find, and correctly determine the specific path or the particular turn of events that will lead the masses to the real, decisive, and final revolutionary struggle. Unquote. When there's a revolutionary situation, everybody becomes active. People who were never political before, they all of a sudden become political. Everybody becomes radicalized. All kinds of people join all kinds of uh, supposedly revolutionary parties. Revolution becomes fashionable. Even communism can be fashionable. There have been many periods in history when communism has been super popular and so many people have joined the communist movement and then when the situation gets tough, they go away. That was certainly the case in this country. Everybody was joining in the 60s and 70s. Not so much in the 90s. Not so much in the 2000s. Now they've gone away. The hard core is still left, but all the wavering elements, they went away. In the Russian Revolution of 1905, everybody became radicalized, and then when the revolution failed, so many people became apathetic. And even a lot of people who remained communist, they became opportunist or revisionist. We've already discussed this in previous episodes. So not only is it far more difficult and, in a sense, far more precious to be a communist, in difficult times and reactionary times than in revolutionary times. Although, of course, in revolutionary times it's also very important to have good communist leaders and good communist activists. But, as Lenin says, it's so much harder to be able to spread communism and to organize the workers in non-revolutionary times, in non-revolutionary bodies, and when most workers are not revolutionized, when they don't really care about uh, politics and when they don't really understand what is going on. And ultra-leftists completely fail at that. They don't even try. They think talking to these workers who don't understand is pointless. They attack the workers. They say that they're stupid. They think working in these uh, non-revolutionary mass bodies, they think that's opportunist. They reject it. They reject it because it's difficult. It's too difficult for them. But it has to be done. And I'm going to end on that note. Because I think, in a way, that should give us um, reason to be optimistic. Because these are difficult times. These are definitely reactionary times, when the level of class consciousness is very low, at least in many countries. Communist parties are relatively small. But it is precisely in these times that communists are needed more than ever. So don't become apathetic, don't become pessimistic, don't lose hope. It certainly looks like we are on the cusp of some kind of huge political event. There might be a world war, there definitely will be a new economic crisis, time will tell, but communists are definitely needed.